All right, so we're gonna talk about the dive industry today. So looking at the slide, these are things that we're gonna go after or we're gonna discuss. So we wanna talk about what the entities are, or what entities are part of the dive industry. We wanna understand what we call the eight E's. Talk about who the average driver is, what business we're in, and we're gonna talk about a SWOT analysis. So let's make a list of all the entities that make up the dive industry. Like businesses? Yeah. Certifying organizations. Yeah, so um, orgs that uh, certify, right? They give out C cards. They create standards, they design programs. So SSI, PADI, TDI, NAWI, YMCA used to for 49 years, I think, or something like that. And, a um, bunch of organizations around the world. There's over 200, I believe. When we say dive industry, do we take into account uh, commercial diving and stuff like that? Or it could be, sure. We can stick within the recreational realm, but the dive industry is bigger than that, right? It's not just recreational diving. I mean, you could, the dive industry also composes of military divers. The military has divers that work both as salvage and um, sort of skilled divers and then they have tactical divers or divers that are specialized in um, the element of using scuba diving in warfare right for infiltration and tactical purposes but they have to get their equipment from somewhere right uh, right so the military doesn't design their own equipment though the military has you know search uh, or not search i'm sorry um research and development However, often those are civilian contractors working as part of, uh, you know, the U.S. government or with a military in another country like France or, or the Netherlands or whatever. But generally what you'll find is that those are designed, developed, and created by civilian agencies who then sell them to government agencies, right? So they still would count. Would, would be the same structure as just recreational diving. Yeah, they'd still fall in the same type of category, right? Uh, the purchasers, the government are purchasers, and there are people that manufacture. So we've already talked about a couple extra, right? We have manufacturers. So I'm just going to abbreviate because I don't feel like doing it. Um, also, we have retailers. You mentioned retailers. So, so who are retailers? Those are the stores. Those are the people that sell uh, wetsuits, BCDs the equipment we, we use, but they also are distributors or sellers of the actual courses themselves, right? So if you think about it, um, an SSI store distributes or sells retail, resells the packages that they buy from SSI or patty shops or whatever. Okay, what are some other areas? Dive shops. So yeah, retailers, shops. You could, these two go together in SSI, like Hand, hand in hand. Um, schools. Resorts. Right? Resorts. What else? A well, boat, right? A like the aggressor. Travel agency. Travel agency. Sure. Travel agency. Um, quite often, at least in the SSI model, the stores and shops have some kind of um, packages that they develop and de design and then sell on to their, their divers, right? So, this is one of the big conflicts between PADU and SSI right now. Not the two agencies per se, but the behaviors that are different in the agencies and the agency's philosophies or models. So PADU in particular has purchased a travel agency. And as a consequence, they're directly competing with their stores now, right? And that can be a problem if you're in the middle of Wyoming where you can only dive during the summer. And even in the summer, it can be cold. Right, and you have limited visibility or green diving, you know, perhaps, or in Oklahoma where it's almost all brown diving, right, because it's just got silt and nastiness inside the water. And then look at the places like the Caribbean where you want to get people to. So you're in Colorado and you're selling to your divers a trip to come to Cozumel. Well, that sort of sucks if you've got a major agency that has a huge marketing arm that is also selling to your people. And, and when you bring the prices down and when you Google, you know, a trip to Cozumel, you know, scuba diving trip to Cozumel or scuba diving trip to Kotal, what happens? Boom, you see Patty right now. So you can see that the philosophy is very different. SSI doesn't compete like that. So it's a very different approach.
You, you see what I'm saying? Um, what are some other areas? Well, professionals. Yep, pros, right? That's what you guys are doing. Like when we say pros, would be guide teachers. Yep. Dive guides, dive masters, instructors, so open water scuba instructors, all the way up to the highest level, which is the, you know, IE or the certifiers and members of the agencies themselves, right? They're out there going to stores and converting people and, and crossing them over from different agencies to their current agency. So does that make sense? Sure. So these are the things that we're looking at. Professionals <laughs> that we just discussed. So DMs, instructors, etc. centers, resorts, dive operations. It could be on a boat, right? Liveaboards, the aggressor is a good example of that. Dive equipment manufacturers. So all the people that make the equipment we use, Cressy, Maris, US divers, whatever, right? And those agencies or those organizations are popping up too. Uh, China starting to become more competitive and so as a consequence, you see a lot more from China um, creating knockoffs, if you will, of products that are already on the market. Um, that's what happens. Patents only last for so long, and then the market's allowed to open up. Almost every country that's a member of WIPO agrees on that in terms of you know, intellectual property, and that's sort of a fair thing. They give you that finite period of time in which to get your money back and then they open it back up to the rest of the world so the rest of the world has the opportunity to create more trade, right? And bring the prices down and um, provide better customer service or whatever. And the Chinese are quite good at doing that. I mean, let's be honest. Um, virtually everything we have comes from China these days. Um, that's no lie, okay? So, all right, let's look at uh, dive uh, organizations, so training organizations. Again, we mentioned them, SSI, PADI, NAWI, and a plethora or virtual cornucopia of dive agencies that are around the world. CMAS is a good example. Uh, many are members of conglomerate organizations. In other words, uh, memberships where they get together and they talk about standards for the United States or the world. And then some are very standalone like CMAS. They're like, we don't need you and we want nothing to do with you. Um, and they have their own uh, sister organizations, if you will, in France, right? When they try. Right, so it just depends on where you're at. Uh, there are new ones popping up around the world. Uh, I've heard of some new ones that are like in Russia. There's a brand new one that's not been around for about a couple of years. So, you know, things like that take place. You, you think about a country like Russia, which is no longer communist. So what happens? All these states pop up and now they're competing at a much higher level in terms of capitalism. So it makes perfect sense that the Russian Federation would start to develop, whether it's in Russia or the UK, Ukraine or whatever, these little organizations that would you know, sort of compete in that market. And that's perfectly fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, what we hope though, is that these organizations create standards or at least mirror the standards that they're used to seeing with other agencies because organizations like SSI, PADI, NAWI, YMCA, they led the path for us and there are 50 years of solid understanding in a self-regulating industry, right? Because that's what we are. We're self-regulating right now. There's only a few places in the world where you're going to see heavy regulations or higher regulations. Yeah, go ahead. That's a good point because I wanted to ask, why not include in the dive industry the, well, regulation body, governments? Yeah, and we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, but it's smaller, right? And generally what happens is in self-regulating regulating industries, the only reason you see the government get involved is because something catastrophic happens, right? We lose human life because somebody does something stupid. And as a consequence, the governments go, yeah, we're not tolerating that anymore because the media gets involved and it becomes a big issue. And then you start to see regulation impede on those organizations that were once in charge on their own. And right now, that's the way it is. And we are, I often tell people, we're like, from a liability standpoint, we're probably one or two major accidents away from that happening to us. So it, it only takes, I mean, <laughs> the bigger governments become, the bigger they become. Governments never remove laws, okay? Like, it, very rarely do you see the government come in and take away law. No, they just keep adding to the law. So it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they become more regulating and more intrusive. That's just the nature of government, right? So we could go on about philosophy, you know, liberalism versus conservatism and that kind of thing. But that's where this comes from. This is why there's, these debates exist. Because some people agree on having more freedom and some people want more of a nanny state, 
where they're told what to do and how to do it and so forth and so on, okay? So uh, training organizations we talked about, trade, resort, retail, water sports organizations. So these trade organizations might be DEMA, for example. DEMA is a marketing organization, sales organization, puts together the largest scuba diving um, conference in the world twice a year, Orlando and Las Vegas right now. So DEMA is a perfect example. Uh, it's only open to professionals. So in other words, you must have a credential that you can send in, they verify it, and then they'll let you buy a ticket, okay? So you have to be an instructor or, or higher and, or own a shop or something like that, and then you can go and see DEMA. And it's quite remarkable, all the equipment and new things that are coming out. You know, um, they have drones for the water now that you can get. Um, you know what I mean? It's really cool. And there's a guy with this thing shooting the drone around. Uh, and that's neat because it's got cameras on it and it can follow divers around and get the, the type of views you want from the boat, right? And that's great for us from a marketing perspective, but it can also be used for scientific research, mapping, whatever, right? So there's a lot of purposes. But when you go to a place like DEMA, you see all kinds of stuff. Uh, the people that make t-shirts, the people that make dive computers, the people that make regulators. Uh, if it's in diving, you're gonna find it there. Water sports organizations, retailers, we talked about those already. Dive media publications, so magazines, blogs, and blogs pop up all the time and get popular. Um, even media publications on things like Instagram and Facebook, right? You could consider a group on Facebook these days a form of media publication if it provides news and interesting stories and information. So it's not, the system's not what it used to be. It used to be you joined an organization, you got a magazine mailed to you once a month or once every six months or every quarter or whatever. Uh, which is an extremely difficult thing to do. I know I've published a magazine. It takes a lot of work, right? And you've then got to print it and it costs a lot of money. These days, man, things just pop up. So you can have a magazine that's entirely digital. I could put out a magazine in two weeks if it's just digital. Like, that's, you know, very possible. So, so this is where we're looking at the rest of them, right? Government organizations, Non-governmental organizations, so NGOs, charities, nonprofits that are involved in shaping the dive industry. It could be ancillary ones like organizations that focus on conservation, not just education, right? Mm -hmm. Not just diving per se or teaching divers, right? It's a much larger organization. Um, let's talk about this for example. <laughs> what are some of the opportunities for divers to work in the industry? Obviously, oh, I can be an instructor. Right? That's what you guys are doing right now. So, you know, I learn, I go out, I teach open water divers, I teach DSDs, I certify specialties, but what are some more out of the box thinking things you could do? Research. Right? So research, you could go get a job with NOAA, right? Construction maintenance. Uh, sure, you could do inspections is a good, inspection. right? Like aquariums need people to go down and inspect the aquariums. And you don't have to be an instructor to do that, but you would obviously have much higher qualifications. Uh, you could still do with regular open circuit scuba inspections of bridges if you were an engineer. Aqueducts, things like that. You don't have to be a commercial diver to dive down to 33 feet and look at the bottom of a bridge. No. Right? Safety divers. Safety divers, right? So uh, Cirque du Soleil had, safety, I think, 16 safety divers during O hidden underneath the water, moving divers or, you know, the acrobats and the performers around. Uh, NASA, mm -hmm. NASA has safety divers for astronauts. So you're moving around million dollar human assets in the water to make sure that they're, you know, learning what they're supposed to be learning so they can do spacewalks. And the, uh, the buoyancy lab in Houston has an exact one for one replica of the International Space Station in water. Yeah, one for one. So astronauts get down there, safety divers move the astronauts, because an astronaut's what? He's in just a big suit. What's he gonna do? He doesn't have any flippers, right? So the d safety divers move that astronaut to the next thing to do their job, as if they were doing a spacewalk. And then there's another, there's another diver that uh, I believe focuses on them with a camera so control can see the person's behavior, their facial expressions, communicate with them, stuff like that. So that's pretty cool. So you can see that there's more to it than just doing what we're doing in recreational diving. People go out and they clean the holes of boats. 
So barnacles get on the side of boats. You go buy a power washer, you walk down to the harbor, you know, you say to the people that own their boat, hey, I'll clean your boat for X amount of money. You plug in the hose, your generator, you hop down, right? Power wash the side of their boat in an hour and get paid a pretty decent amount of money for that, right? People have made tons of money going and collecting golf balls, putting on your gear, going to the water hazards, pulling out golf balls, selling them back for you know, three cents or five cents a golf ball. How much did this one guy make? Uh, he made over a million dollars over 10 years. Yeah. yeah, he did it illegally at first for several years. So new career objective? Make one million dollars with golf balls, right? So the point behind this is that the industry is not just what you see with SSI or Patty or anything like that, right? The industry has a lot more to it. So dive societies and clubs, that's like uh, the one in Britain. They're not a teaching organization per se, they're a club, um, BSEC, right? So they have a ton of members and not just in Great Britain, they're represented internationally as well. So you can see that there's a lot to this. All right, the eight E's. So the ones we're gonna look at, um, I've pulled a little bit of this stuff from Patty because I have experience obviously with them before I became an instructor trainer with SSI. So I use some of the similar concepts. When I'm teaching this, I'm gonna teach you obviously exactly what SSI is required for you to be an instructor. But also I want you to think about uh, how the industry as a whole has other things to offer, right? It's very important that we learn good things. It doesn't matter where the source is. Right? That's, a, that's a fallacy of argumentation. If someone says, oh, I can't listen to that because it comes from so-and-so, that's absolutely inappropriate. Right? We want good information that we can use. doesn't matter where the source. It's irrelevant. So equipment, education, experiences, environment. Right? So when we talk about equipment, obviously, from SSI's perspective, that's the diver diamond. We want people to have their own equipment. Now, I'm going slightly out of sequence on this, but it does cover it. When we look at the diver diamond, we have skills, experience, equipment, and knowledge. And of course, I'm going to cover this a bit more in detail, but it also comes into the eight E's. So in equipment, we want our own dive set, right? We want our own fins, our own mask, our own snorkel, our BCD, our regulator, right? We want our own computer. We want to be able to model the best practices for our students. Education, of course, not just the education that our students first do with their open water course, but additional, right? So if we bring them in through an acquisition program, such as a try dive or discover scuba diving or one of the children's programs like, you know, the scuba rangers, these are acquisition programs that bring them into our pipeline for the lack of a better term. And we want to continue to keep them in that pipeline so that they grow and they become more experienced. Going back to the diver diamond, that's skills and knowledge right? So education is very important, not just for the student so that they can become better divers, but also for the industry as a whole, right? If we don't have divers continuing education and staying involved and actively participating, the industry won't exist. That's just the nature of it. So experiences. Under experiences, we have another four E's that I put in there. Entertainment, exploration, excitement, and enjoyment. Right? These are not all the same thing, even though excitement and enjoyment are both close. Entertainment, right? We want people to go out and have fun, especially these days. People are entertained by the most superficial things online. You know, hey, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole in Facebook and watch cat videos for freaking 17 hours, right? People are easily sidetracked. I think there was a study that said a goldfish has like the attention span of about 13 seconds, and apparently we're starting to encroach upon that record as human beings, that our attention span is starting to approach that of a goldfish, which is really sad, right? So we're competing with a lot of noise in the world. So as diving instructors, the question is, how do we really reach out to them? We'll touch more about that in marketing stuff, but you get the concept, right? We want them to be entertained because entertainment makes them enjoy themselves. They're more likely to come back and do it again. What we don't want is people to have bad experiences. So when they come to train with us and they're like, oh, this sucks. I'm never going back there again. You know, I sucked a bunch of water through my nose. I started coughing. They had to do CPR on me. You know, these are, these are not the things that generally draw people back into the industry, which is why when we teach, we teach very intelligently. We break them down into steps, right? We don't just go, here, 
pop into the water and take your mask off. <laughs> do a mask removal and replace. What? No, we do what? Partial flood, full flood, mask removal and replace, breathing without a mask, no mask swim, right? There's this whole progress that we do intentionally, very intelligently, breaking it down into steps. And that gives us the flexibility, too, to, to work with them and not force, <coughs> not force them into it, right? Think of it like a black belt. You want to become a black belt, what happens? You've got to work your way through belts, right? You get a white belt with a bunch of stripes and then a yellow belt with a bunch of stripes, you know. Yeah, actually, you're you know. exactly right because the black belt is normally the first level. Yeah, precisely correct. So... That's right. I always tell my black belt students when they get their black belt, they're just now a very qualified student. You know, we don't give instructor certifications to our black belts. You actually have to go through a program to become an instructor, right? So you can have a black belt next to somebody who might have several stripes, what we call Dan's, and then you got another black belt, and they have a sort of wrapped around piece of cloth that's colored red, and then it has stripes. Well, that red sash, if you will, that's been sewn onto the belt is our indicator that that person's an instructor. So in, in our school, that's we go, well, instructor, not, right? Still black belt, very qualified. You can sort of approach it, not entirely. I don't know that this quite makes sense, but you get the gist of it. A master diver is sort of like a black belt, right? They've worked their way up. They've done a bunch of different belts, you know, yellow, orange, blue, green, whatever. And that would be specialties and the amount of dives and spending time actually doing the, the art. So exploration. Exploration obviously is sort of harkens back to what we were talking about with travel, right? Travel is really, really important. Getting people out into areas that are different because honestly, diving in cold water is not my thing. I don't really want to be a part of that. I don't like diving in brown water. I certainly don't like diving in black water anymore. Um, I try not to do that unless, you know, I'm doing something with the government and or training a course. It's just no fun, right? Which public safety diving, that's what I'm talking about, which is another area that you can be involved in, going back to the list that we have. Excitement, we want them to be excited. That's so important, right? It, it is about fun. It is about enjoyment. It is about getting them involved and getting them really happy. And environment. So environment, we talked a little bit about, we touched on that with the organizations. There are like coral conservation organizations, that kind of thing. It's truly important that as divers, you know, the saying is that we are the best ambassadors of the ocean, right? And that really is true. I mean, think back 1960s, 1970s, 1980s television, who do you think of? He's French. Jacques Cousteau, right? He's the one that started doing television programs. He's the one that got people involved. I remember watching him as a kid in the 70s and being like, oh my God, that's amazing. You know what I mean? And then things like Sequest and television shows that came on back then were, you know, Max sitting on top of the head and all the pictures, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, equipment matters because it's critical to the success of the industry. We can't dive without it. And selling it to students and certified divers produces an important additional income that keeps the business running. That's the crux of it, right? Some businesses, some dive centers cannot survive, period, without equipment. If they're not selling BCDs and getting that markup profit margin, they're in trouble because they don't sell enough students. I know one shop, lovely, lovely person that owns it, 2,000 square feet in the middle of town, very expensive rent, full of equipment, no students, hardly at all. As a professional, why should you have clean professional and well-serviced equipment again? Because you're modeling, right? Yeah. Not only is it good for you to use it, of course, but... Well, for safety first? Yep, of course. Yeah. Yep, your safety, own, your own equipment. Your student's safety? Or Absolutely. Your safety, but as an example as well, yeah. 100%. You're the most influential in the industry. Divers are going to ask you why you bought what you bought, and they're very likely going to buy what you buy, right? Perfect example. You bought Cressy, we sell Cressy. I wear Cressy, like almost... Everything I have is Cressy. I like the, the organization. I like their history. I like the fact that they've been around for 70 plus years and, and the family still owns it. I think that's cool. You know what I mean? Those kind of things matter to me. Comfortable, looks good. Yep, nice. comfortable, looks good. Things are amazing. 
There's, yeah, there's plenty of other organizations or other companies that produce equipment. I happen to sell Cressy. Education. So why does education matter? We talked about that. Without well-designed and organized educational systems in place, we can't pass on standards and skills that we create new divers and encourage certified divers to continue to learn, and grow, and dive, right? That's the crux of it. New experiences are essential to growth, building knowledge, and honing skill. That brings us back to the Diver Diamond, right? It's the backbone of entertainment, exploration, and creating excitement and enjoyment, all of which work together to keep divers coming back. And we talked about why the environment matters. We're the sea's best ambassadors. There's nothing to see, nobody goes to the ocean. Like, go diving in Lake Tahoe, there's nothing there. You occasionally see a fish. It's very clear, it's very desolate, there's not a whole lot of life. I go there to practice when I live there because I want to dive, but it's not my favorite place to dive. Not to mention it gets really cold. But there's not a whole lot to see. Coral's awesome, right? What's cool about recreational limits is everything you want to see is pretty much within it recreational is, yeah. limits. Like anything that's really worth seeing, like coral bodies and that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> deeper dives, we're talking about wreck diving, stuff like that. But, but yeah, wreck diving or tank diving would be a new experience. Sure. Not as much as seeing things. Yeah, absolutely. But trying new things. Learning new, new techniques, experiencing new things. I'm not really huge into seeing how far I can dive. I'm, it's just not really my thing. I would rather go spend that money on seeing wrecks. However, there are wrecks that I want to see that require me to know how to dive deeper. So I, I do. But uh, it's not something I do every day. It's like, you know, once a year or something like that. You know, so there's plenty of wrecks around here that we can go see anytime we want. And they're all under 100 feet. You know what I mean? So that's well within the scope of our training. So who's the average diver now? 63% of divers are male, give or take. These percentages, of course, will change a little bit each year. And 37% are female. The average age is 29 years old, 30 for males, 27 for females. Average income is 20%, 22% is over 100,000 US. Right? So uh, you could jokingly say it is a white man sport. Now, that's not meant to be offensive or, or rude. But let's be honest, it's a lot like golf, which also underscores the need for us to be involved in local communities and make sure that these people are getting access, not just to make a profit. And this is where I'm sort of divergent on some of the views, right? Dive Mentor is a nonprofit, and as a consequence, our focus isn't just about money. Now, that doesn't mean that it's wrong to be a profit company. I have profit companies of my own. That's not what I'm suggesting. There are some areas, though, that I think are worth investing in, and somebody's got to do it. It doesn't have to be one of the agencies, one of the big agencies, but somebody has to do it. Somebody needs to step up and say, what do we do to help train the locals who can't afford necessarily to pay the prices that we pay in the West, right? In Mexico, in Honduras, in Thailand, the only reason that the locals are going to be diving is because they're involved in the industry somehow, right? Or if they're doing it for subsistence, right? Divers who get the equipment and go down and get lobsters or whatever they do for consumption for food or maybe as a small business. Maybe they're doing that to sell those things on to other people. But then the consequences are high. Like I said, go do some research in Honduras and you'll see that's a, that's a problem for lobster divers. Mm -hmm. They're using equipment, they don't know what they're doing and they're suffering the consequences. And that's, that sucks, man. I would rather invest my time and give my time as an instructor away to a few people so that I know that they're actually passing on good skill sets. So, and that again, like we said earlier, that underscores the need for proper education, right? Because you can get hurt. It's not an inherently dangerous sport, but it has dangers in it. It has risks in it, right? So, and when I was saying about it being a white man sport, that isn't me being rude. That isn't me being racist by any stretch of the imagination. It's, the problem is it's expensive. It costs money. And it's often way more than the average person is going to be making in developing nations, right? So 65% of divers have a college degree or higher. In other words, an uh, undergraduate degree or a master's or even a doctorate. And your demographics, of course, are going to be variable. Depends on where you're at. And why does understanding the demographics actually matter? Well, demographics and statistics help us design strategies, tactics, and operations around what we know about the people who buy our products 
and the services that we sell. The more we know about these people, the better business decisions we can make. And of course, the more profit we can produce, which continues to fuel the cycle. Let me make something really clear that even though we're a nonprofit, that doesn't mean we don't produce profit. It doesn't mean there's no money. It's just what we do with that profit is different. So in other words, if it's a profit company that's owned by a few stakeholders, the stakeholders benefit directly, right? So they get the money, it goes into their pocket, they can do with it, <coughs> they can do with it as they choose. And often these organizations are owned by investors, people who aren't even involved in the industry, who don't even necessarily have a interest in the industry. There are plenty of people who buy stocks for companies that know nothing about that company and, and don't really care. They just want the money. So a nonprofit, at the end of the year, that money has to have been used for good. In other words, it has to have been used to benefit society, not just benefit stakeholders. Or to benefit the own nonprofit. Yeah, but it has to be in a very public service oriented way, right? Not just like a special project, right, not right. just to buy a new house. Hey, look, yeah, you know, we're we're a nonprofit. We built a brand new compound and we got a bunch of new art, you know, new RVs and you know that's People, organizations do that, but that just makes me sick. So now to the Diver Diamond, right? We've touched on it several times. And the concept behind the Diver Diamond is straight out to create safe and comfortable divers. And there are four main elements that are illustrated in the diagram itself. Again, that's skills, experience, equipment, and knowledge. Customer loyalty cycle is also unique to SSI. However, if you look at it and you read it, you'll understand that it really does fit into a typical sales model, right? Customer acquisition, customer development, customer commitment, and customer retention. And if you look underneath that, the customer acquisition is the assurance phase. Hey, this is really gonna be fun, you're gonna enjoy it. In the customer development side, education, bonding. In other words, you're getting to know these people and develop relationships with them, and those relationships benefit that cycle. Question. Sure. Why does the customer development come before the customer commitment? Because commitment doesn't happen until they actually are vested in the, in the, part, in the project or the sport. So we say that you invest in an open workforce it's development or it's commitment? Yeah, it's development because you can do one course and walk away from it. You could do an acquisition program like a tri dive, and you yeah. pay, you paid you know sixty bucks or seventy bucks, and you're like, oh, I had fun for an hour or two or three, wherever, however they're doing the program, and you're like, yeah, it's not for me, right? That's not really an investment. This it's is an acquisition, but the open water course might be an investment. It could be, sure. Sure, that's certainly more of an investment, especially if you do four days and you pay $547 you know, or something like that. That's an investment. Um, it depends on where, of course, you do it because the competition in the industry produces courses being sold for pretty much pennies and other organizations have to do it for hire or companies have to do it for hire to stay in business. So this is an interesting thing that you get into when you get into the business side of this. So customer commitment is really about I'm, I'm really enjoying it, I like it, I've got good friends and relationships that I've developed at the dive shop or dive school, I wanna continue with it now, now what happens? People tend to spend more money, right? They show up and they hang around the shop, you know, hey guys, how's it going? You know, I'm thinking about maybe becoming a dive master now. You know, hey, can I move your tanks for you? You know what I mean? That's what happens, you know? Um, because they wanna be a part of it, and that's awesome, because that's how we keep people in the industry. So that customer commitment side is more courses and equipment and things like that, where they actually make a substantial financial investment and an emotional and logical investment, right? They're committed. And then customer retention are the activity phases, the things that we do to keep them engaged, right? If you only sell to them and kick them out the door, right, and you don't do good customer service, you don't follow up with them, you don't have a relationship with them, they're probably gonna stick it in their garage or they're gonna hang their clothes up on top of their gym, right? Right, that's what happens. So 
part of our job as instructors or dive shop owners or center managers or whatever is to keep that cycle running. And it is a cycle. That's why they call it a cycle, right? So it's round and round. It doesn't stop. So the blurb is to succeed, you must acquire new customers and keep existing customers. And it applies to everyone from dive guides to the instructor certifier who will sign your IEs. We're all involved in the process. So what business are we in? The life transformation business. So if you think about it, that's sort of what we're doing. We're giving life experiences to people. We only live once as far as we're aware. We, you can dissect that and argue you know, any religions and philosophical views, but I only know for certain, I think, that I'm here right now, <laughs> right? Not true, you know, it could be that this is just a dream too, I perceive. you know. I, 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 I think therefore I am, right? Um, so in many respects as dive instructors, we have this really cool opportunity to engage and connect with other people and give them life experiences that they wouldn't otherwise get. And it's sad because if you think about it, there's only you know X amount of million divers in the last 50 years. Well, there's billions of people on the planet. There's all these people that have never seen a massive coral head at 65 feet. They've never seen an eagle ray. Oh my God, right? They've never had turtles chill out past them. They don't know. They just don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they're missing. And that's such an exciting thing that we get to be able to share. So diving can be an escape, an adventure. It can turn stress into joy and happiness. And it's a beautiful enriching experience. And that is that's the God's honest truth. That's why I do what I do. That's why I teach what I teach. That's why I teach instructors. Because for me, diving is cathartic. Coming from a military background, coming from an emergency medicine background where I've spent time watching people go through the worst experiences of their lives and often not recover from that, you gotta find an outlet. Um, I don't drink because I don't want that to become my outlet. You know what I mean? I don't wanna self-medicate to deal with the stresses in my life. So I found other outlets, like jumping out of planes and flying PPGs and scuba, scuba diving is awesome. So for me, again, it's very cathartic. When I'm down diving, I don't think about anything else but diving. I don't, I'm not like looking at my phone, I'm not watching cat videos on Facebook, right? I'm sure that will come someday. Yeah. There's somebody out there right now thinking, how do I get Facebook and diving? That's so sad, <laughs> right? But you get the gist. So diving's more than a sport. It holds life-changing value. And in my opinion, it should be marketed that way. That's really what we're wanting to market to people. Not just buying equipment and taking courses. The experience, what they're gonna get out of it. Remember, whenever you're selling something, like let's say that I'm, I'm writing copy on a website or in a magazine. Copy is the marketing blurb that I'm giving to the person to, to read, right? And we gotta get in with headlines and hooks and we want to make sure that person continues to read the marketing information we're giving them. Well, the basic rule is for every time I say me or I, I should say you 10 times. You see what I'm saying? It, what I am, oh, I am this, I am that, really doesn't matter. The person reading it is like, what's in it for me, dude? Right, so that's what we're looking at. We wanna be able to say to them, hey listen, this is an amazing, incredible opportunity for you to see something that only a small fraction of human beings have ever seen in their lives. And that will continue to be the case. We're not gonna become Atlantis, I don't care how many times the comic books say so. You know what I mean? It would be pretty badass, I have to admit. <laughs> so what are some other reasons that it can be life-changing? And I touched on those a little bit. Fear can be changed to courage, faint-heartedness uh, converted to accomplishment. So it's when somebody's like really timid and then they accomplish something, that's a, an incredible sense of you know, achievement, excitement, makes them have a sense of self-value and worth, right? Timidity transformed into confidence, anticipation turned into passion. So someone's like, oh, I can't wait to do this. And then they, oh my God, I love doing this. I mean, I think that defines quite a few of us in this room. It can open hearts and minds to nature. So where once people were like not interested, like maybe, uh, I don't know, sharks are a little freaky to me, man. 
and then they're like, oh my God, that shark was incredible, you know, like doing a bull shark in Playa, you know, or hammerheads in the Galapagos. I mean, there's nothing like being in the Galapagos in regular dark bluish water, and then all of a sudden it's dark, like night, and you look up that there's hundreds and hundreds of hammerheads, you know what I mean? Literally that many, you know. Foster self-esteem in another person, so people, this is an opportunity for us to connect with people that might not have that confidence and to help build their self-esteem and give them more confidence, help them grow as people. That's what a gift to be able to do that. And it instills character and discipline. Done properly, you have to be disciplined to be a diver. You need to check your gear, right? We don't want to go out there and have a diving accident, so that means that we have to do things right the same time or the same way every single time. It's like flying a plane. When I'm getting into a plane and I decide I'm going to go from, say, SFO to LAX, right, and I want to make that flight in a, in a small aircraft, before that aircraft even leaves the ground, what do I do? Pre-flight safety check. And I have a list that I mark off with an alcohol pen. It's laminated in a list. Why? Because I don't want to be up there and forget that I didn't switch my tank in the right direction. Right? <clears throat> oh, shit. Oops. What did I forget? Right? No, that's the check one I forgot. Now, let's talk about SWAT. We're not talking about special weapons and tactics. This isn't like a... This isn't like a SWAT team with the police department. SWAT, S-W-O-T, stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. So from a business perspective, if you did your MBA or an undergraduate in business and you had to do any projects, this is the kind of thing that you're going to do. And why do you think this might matter, this analysis? If you think about the demographic stuff that we talked about, right? This is now an opportunity for you to get a better idea of how you can grow in the industry, how you can make money in the industry, right? Or make industry grow as well. That's right. If you're not making money, this is going to get really old really quick. Okay? I'm telling you. The problem with the industry, though, depending on where you live, is that there isn't a whole lot of money with shops. There's a very small percentage of profit that has to be split between a lot of people, right? The instructors the tank suppliers if you're not if you don't have your own tanks and your own you know um, air supply your compressors there's money that has to be spent on transportation it still costs money to put petrol into your vehicle to take your divers from point a to point b boats dive masters license fees for the parks if you're in a marine park like we are things like that all take the money that you make right and unfortunately, the people who get the least amount are the people who are the most impactful in the industry, and that's instructors. Dive masters sometimes get paid better than instructors do. So it depends on where you're at. Uh, I'll give you an example. A dive master that goes on a boat and is with four divers and gets paid 50 bucks for four divers for an hour, or an instructor who teaches a four-day course and gets 50 bucks for, for it per, per student. Who's actually making higher profit? The dive master is. Time is money. Four days, break it down. You're making not a lot of money, right? This is why it's very important to think about equipment sales and also out of the box thinking. What other things can you do as a dive instructor to bring new divers in and to, of course, increase your profit margins? Because you need to make an, an income, you have to. Unless you're filthy rich on your own, which if you are, I've got a dive shop to sell for you. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? So. SWAT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Now let's break those down individually. So what is a strength? Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, we could pick this place, right? We're in Cosmo, Mexico, so, mm -hmm. so what is a strength? Clear blue water, water temperature. Absolutely, right? So location. So location. Oh, that pen sucks. Let's get another pen. <laughs> okay, that's uh, location. So location, when we're talking about location, this is broken down into several categories, right? Location is going to be the quality of the water. It's going to be proximity, right? Mm -hmm. Temperature. Marine 
Yeah. Right? Marine life. I should have just put life. Um, what else? Culture. Mm -hmm. Right? Location could be an opportunity as well. Sure. Yeah. It could be both strengths and opportunities. And we'll definitely break that down in a second. But I'm breaking down location for the sake of looking what some of these subcategories are. So a strength in location would be the water's freaking amazing. It's clear. It's warm. Literally, when you ask somebody, hey, what's the visibility in Cozumel? Well, how far can you see? Right? If you have 20-20 vision, it's a long ways. If you have to wear glasses, put them in your, those lenses in your mask because you're going to want to. <laughs> right? Or wear contacts and keep your eyes closed. Make sense? Proximity is a strength to the United States, a massive country with extreme wealth and lots of lots of white people with money who have degrees, <laughs> right? Jok jokingly to go back to diving, right? Okay. Of course I'm kidding, but you get the point, right? So proximity, you know, you could fly into Houston with Southwest Airlines for nothing and then fly from, fly from Houston into Cancun, take the ADO from Cancun to Playa, ferry over from Playa. It's nice having a card because I pay one third. It's way, way cheaper. But you get the gist, right? Make sense? OK. Um, marine life is freaking incredible. You're going to see things here that you won't see in other places because it's a marine park. So that, these are strengths. Make sense? All right, weaknesses. So when we're talking about weaknesses, one of the biggest things here is you walk down the street, and what do you see? You see shops that teach diving like, like a Starbucks in the middle of New York. Okay, they're on every damn corner. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So competition, right? So we'll say competition is a massive, massive weakness if you're just teaching instruct, um, just courses. If you're teaching, like in my case, I'm one of very few instructor trainers in the entire area. And so that gives me a little bit of a benefit to be able to teach SSI courses. If I were a PADI course director, my understanding is there's about 26 of them in the area. Out of 26, that sort of, you have a lot of competition, right? Makes sense. So it's also a strength. So if you're just an open water instructor in Cozumel, in particular, if you're just a paddy, ah, if you're just a paddy dive master in Cozumel, that's a serious weakness. Why? They don't hire. They don't hire dive masters in Cozumel. You're actually taking work away from the locals. And rightly so, they've enacted laws to protect those dive masters. Right? You have to hire Mexicans. So that's good for Mexicans, bad for Westerners who think they're going to come here and be dive masters. Right? So that, by definition, is a weakness for this particular area. What are some other weaknesses? Marine park fee. Marine park fees. Yeah, it's an extra fee that you have to put in. Fair enough. Boat ownership is way, way too expensive. Boat what? Boat ownership. Ah, yes. So if you want to get a boat in the marine park, you have to have a license to do that. And that's extremely expensive because they're limited, right? So it's a lot like if you're in a big city and you want to start a bar, you have to get an alcohol license. Well, that alcohol license often is now through the roof because it's sold from one bar to the next. Okay, let's drill down a little bit more on weaknesses then. Maybe a lack of education. A lack of education. Right? Like maybe you don't have enough to be able to offer to the clientele. Or in your case, uh, the, well, depending on the other fees, but the lack of gear to sell. Sure. Yeah, a weakness if you don't sell gear. So in our case, we're more of a career development center. That's our goal and our direction. So our focus is more on teaching dive masters all the way up to assistant instructor trainers, specialty instructors, dive master instructors. So we're actually providing a service to schools in say geographically restricted locations where they can't do that kind of thing. Or if they don't have the, an instructor trainer on staff, they can send them down here and train with us and they can get the credentials they need to go back and help that dive center be more successful. So as a consequence of that relationship, I don't sell gear or we don't sell gear to those candidates, right? Because if we do, we're in direct conflict with the shops and the stores that we're trying to help succeed. So by definition, that would be a weakness. 
a weakness in the sense that we can't sell and make profit from that, but it's also a strength in that it allows other shops to trust us to be able to send their candidates and students to us. So you might write both. And that's okay, because that's what this analysis is about. Is it a strength? Is it a weakness? Is it, just like you said, maybe my perspective of a weakness is slightly different than your perspective. And that's okay. This is somewhat subjective. And on your strategy. Right? And the strategy does matter. So what else? So let's talk about opportunities. What are some of the opportunities if you were going to be an instructor in Cosmo? Yeah, I think being SSI is an opportunity here, and here's why. Patty is proliferated, right? They are saturated in this market. So if you are a Patty instructor, and you're competing against hundreds of other Patty instructors, even if there's turnover, you're still waiting in line. And I'll give you an example. One of my good friends runs a school. He's an entirely Patty shop. I used to teach their instructor development courses, right? So I'm very familiar with that process before I came over to SSI and became an instructor trainer. There are tons of students that we've worked with that are instructors who want to teach, but they have to wait in line. So they're, oh, look, there's a two-pack open water. Well, I get to go out and I get to co-teach, so I'll get points, but I don't get paid, mm -hmm. right? So one person's learning and gaining experience while the other one gets to pocket the income. And that income is minimal, right? So at the end of the month, do you have enough income to pay your mortgage, or not mortgage here, sorry, I think like a house owner, to pay your rent, right? These are things you have to think about. Like, that's a real problem. So being SSI, in my opinion, I think that opens up the door for you to have less competition because there are less SSI instructors on this island. Now, in fairness, there are less SSI centers as well, but that is changing, that's grown. That is actually my question. What about, you're not patting your SSI, but what about being uh, SEI or ACOC? Yeah, so the smaller the agency, the less the opportunity and less it's a niche market. If you're tech, that's a niche market, right? So if you're with somebody like, what, TDI? Mm -hmm. um, of course, Patty is encroaching on the tech market. SSI is encroaching on the tech market. Why? Because you'd be stupid not to as a business, right? Um, and they sew it up, right? So what's the deal? If you're, if you're a course director for Patty, you're not allowed to teach anything that Patty teaches. <laughs> Same with SSI, right? These are the agreements. Now, SSI is more flexible with me right now, temporarily, because I moved over from Patty to SSI, and so that's growing. And I have to sort of get all my ducks in a row, and so they're being very generous. But the rule is, I need to be moving towards SSI. So as the higher you get, the more you become committed to the agency and the agency's pathways. And that's perfectly fine. But if I wanna teach something that they don't teach, so for example, right this moment, SSI doesn't have a comprehensive program for public safety divers, right? So public safety divers, fire departments, rescue teams, um, police departments, you know, for recovery and that kind of thing. Patty has a program. Now, Patty's not the only organization that has a program, right? I think it's ED, EDRI or ERDI. ERDI. Yeah, sorry, I'm not familiar. I don't know them very well. So I know they've got a very comprehensive program. There's another compre comprehensive program out of Colorado. Um, the military has its own programs. Some state police departments have their own programs. My, my point is, is that if SSI doesn't have that, then it's perfectly fine for me to teach an ancillary program from another agency or be associated with that. But what will eventually happen, any logical business will develop their own core curriculum so that they maintain that structure. That's just business, man. There's nothing illogical about that at all. So what are some other weaknesses? Oh, not. Opportunities. opportunities, sorry, opportunities. Cruise ships. Yeah, cruise ships, perfect opportunity. Yeah. Cruise ships come in here in the droves in this place, right? And tons of large Americans, you know, white, <laughs> white, white men. If you've been watching this video, you know we've been joking about that. Please don't get offended. I don't need the comments. I understand. So these people are coming off with their income, right? And they want to go do something fun. So is that a good opportunity for open water? No. 
No, definitely not, right? It's, it's just not. So it's a good opportunity for tri dives or DSDs, as Patty would call it, or nice. fun dives, right? Fun dives, tri dives, snorkeling. Absolutely. These are the kind of things, these acquisition programs that we were talking about. Things that they can do that is fun, it's relatively inexpensive, and they can get right to it. There's not a whole lot of training required to do it, right? As long as we do it in a really safe, controlled way, it creates future divers. So fun dives is a great thing too, right? Uh, the problem is we can't really take them on the boats unless they're here for a whole day, right? Because that's, that's a bit of a process. If we do a two tank dive, we're out there most of the day, early in the morning until afternoon, okay? So that's a good opportunity. What are the opportunities? Here's one you probably haven't thought of yet, but you probably, it crossed your mind, lionfish. Oh, yeah. So we have a proliferation of lionfish, right? The marine park doesn't want lionfish. They want to avoid that happening. So if you develop a relationship with the marine park and get your permit, you can take people lionfish diving. Then you get the lionfish, you have your ceviche, and that's a cool experience. So. You get the gist, right? Now threats, we touched on that a little bit. Again, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And so threats, what are threats? You must have a permit to be in the marine park. Potential threat. Can you get it? Well, do you have a work permit? Threat, right? The dive industry has a bit of a problem in my opinion. Um, and I've had discussions with people who think that I'm being overly critical uh, and they're not really a fan of that. Uh, in the industry, but I think it's something that we should be looking at as an industry. We have people that work all over the world without permission. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it sucks because pros and cons, right? The, some countries are harder to get a work permit and it's not for any reason that's practical. It's just because that's the way they are. That's the way the system is. Um, some countries you can get a work permit because you pay for the visa. Here's some money. There you go, you can go work, right? Because some countries deal with corruption. You can buy off officials, you know what I mean? Well, sometimes the countries officially, they just need money, so they ask for money. That too. Um, I've been to countries where I just paid for the visa. And literally, you have to be, just come visit, right? You gotta pay for a visa to go to Cuba. You gotta pay for a visa to go to Turkey. These are examples, right? I know because I've paid for those visas. States. Yeah, depends on where you're from. In the United States, you might have to pay. You know, I don't. <laughs> um, but I went through an immigration process to work and live in the United Kingdom, right? Tier one visa, entrepreneur visa, I had to invest. It's a long process, had to get background checks, had to get fingerprints, retina scan, all that, just so that I could go and work there. And they put in my visa and so forth. And then I had to go through the same process for Mexico, yes, Mexico. Yes, Mexico. <laughs> right? I had to go through the whole process. Background check, you know, pre-screening in, in Dallas. I had to pay fees. I had to submit application. I had to submit bank statements. I had to submit all kinds of information. Right? And then they said, go down to Mexico and do the rest of it there. And I did. And then they went through all my stuff. Right? And they finally issued me my permanent residence. Now I have a card, it's a green card, which is ironic, <laughs> right? So I have a green card in Mexico, and then to be able to work, what did I have to do? I had to notify the immigration that I was going to be doing instructing and provide them information. I had to go file with SAT, which is like the Social Security Administration in the United States, and I had to get a number, a CURP, CURP number, which is like a Social Security number. So I had to go through the whole process to be able to work here. It sucks, it's expensive, it's time, but I'm legal and I'm not breaking the laws and now I'm a contributing member of Mexican society. We can all do that, but most people don't want it. That's the problem. And the diving industry tends to make it easy for people to run around hiding you know, with their tanks and stuff like that. Um, and I get it. I know a lot of good people who have done that, who've worked all over the world, Thailand, Malaysia, you know, the United States, and so on and so on. Uh, it's, it's, one of those things you just want to look at and see what you can do. But is that a threat if you don't have a work permit? Damn right it is, because you can get caught and then they put a stamp in your stamp, on your stamp that says you can't come back. I got a good friend of mine who I, I love dearly,
who went to Kotao, did his instructor, um, then went into tech, crossed over to SSI, crossed over TDI, did a bunch of work. Uh, he had a dive accident where he had to go into the hospital for decompression because he was doing really deep dives. And during the stay in the hospital, he overstayed his visa. And they said, bye, you're not coming back. He's like, but I was in the hospital. They said, uh-huh, you're just another Westerner trying to take our jobs. Literally, that's basically what they told him to his face and said, get out. And so he can't go back to Thailand for however long. So now he's back in Europe. So, so, so it is a threat. Okay, so that gives you sort of an idea. Uh, of course, all these shops down here, Patty is a threat to SSI. SSI is a threat to Patty. TDI is a threat to SSI and Patty, right? These other smaller organizations, albeit smaller threats, they're still threats. They're threats to you, definitely, and they're threats to the organizations a little bit, okay? So things like that all matter. So your role, what is your main role as an instructor now? To model the diver diamond, good diving practices, the eight E's that I've discussed, and SSI philosophies. So as SSI instructors, that's your role within SSI. If you leave the agency, fine. You will have a different role perhaps with wherever you go, but it's essentially the same. The diver diamond in SSI is just as applicable as it is to Patty, as it is to Naui, as it is to any other organization. The concept behind it is good, rational, logical philosophy that can be applied to your diving career no matter what agency you're with, although we'd like you to stay with SSI. I think SSI is a fantastic organization built on a great philosophy and they're growing, so there's really good opportunities for us here. So divers need and want your advice. Divers, dive operations rely on you to inform divers. Everyone benefits from protecting the environment. You're the most influential when it comes to what divers are interested in, invest in, and care about. The sale of equipment, travel, and continuing education is the lifeblood of dive centers and resorts. You play a direct role in that. So you are by definition a knowledge counselor, which is <gasps> on the diver diamond. <laughs> so you pass on knowledge directly by teaching, you pass on knowledge indirectly by modeling, you help divers grow through mentoring, which is really big for us. We believe in mentoring, not just teaching. You make recommendations to divers that they will follow. You explain features and benefits of other programs. So you talk about them and share those programs. And you use SSI material to help divers grow and to plot growth. In other words, where are they gonna go? And what do we do? We have these types of things that we can say, well, you know, you're an open water diver now, but after you do your open water diver, you can go to advanced and so on and so on. So you help them with that process. You're a skills counselor, <gasps> diver diamond, right? You model proper diving skills at all time. You teach skills to new and certified divers. You model correct diving behaviors. So you don't just throw your mask up on your head when you're talking, you flip it around backwards or you put it down on your neck or you slip it on your arm. Correct incorrect diving practices. So if you see a diver acting in an inappropriate way, respectfully, politely, correct them. Don't be a jerk. This is in the military. You're not a sergeant in charge of privates, right? And you're not gonna get anywhere with somebody on a dive boat that you don't know. But it's not a bad idea to say, hey man, you mind if I share some uh, thought with you about your equipment configuration. Um, you're, you can certainly do whatever you like. I just have an idea that might benefit you if you're interested. Get permission, mm -hmm. right? And as soon as they give you permission, you're like, oh, you suck! No, <laughs> no, no, not really. But you know, once you get permission, you can certainly share more now and they're not gonna be as offended, right? But guys are the worst. If I just walk up to a guy and start telling him, hey dude, that's some, what the, what, I, really? Right? It's not going to go over well. So you encourage divers to practice correctly. Good word, right? Encourage. And you help divers discover new skills to learn. You're an equipment counselor. Again, back to the diver diamond. You model equipment in your daily interactions. Students and divers will imitate your choices. You provide advice and experience about equipment. 
and you educate divers about equipment, the pros and the cons, why one piece of equipment will benefit. You know, example might be a balanced or unbalanced regulator, right? Why does it matter? When will it benefit them? Why do you have one versus not having one? Without proper equipment, divers won't dive, right? If it fits bad or it hurts, a good example is integrated weights are so much nicer than weight belts, right? Weight belts often weigh heavily on the hips. They rub, they don't fit right, they slide, they change your balance. You know, perfectly fine learning it. I think everybody should learn with a weight belt because when you travel around the world, weight belts are more common than integrated because they're more, ex more expensive integrated, right? So for me, um, I understand why you want to do that and train with that. But if you have the option to dive with integrated versus weight belt, I don't know why you would pick a weight belt. I just don't, except for training purposes. You're an experienced counselor. Again, diver diamond. You share experiences that encourage diving. Man, once when I was in Koh Tao, right? Oh, when I did that dive, you know, that shipwreck was amazing. That right? lionfish ceviche was very good. Yeah, loved that lionfish ceviche. You know, why do you have six lobsters? Well, that's an interesting story, <laughs> right? So, I mean, you get to share those kind of experiences and that encourages them to want to go too. Like, I mean, there are so many wonderful places to go dive like absolutely incredible places around the world, and you hear about them from people, it's way better than when you're reading it. Like you can read a blog, and be like, oh, that's cool, look at the pictures. And then you meet somebody who you like and you get along with, and you were just diving yesterday, and they start telling you about a particular dive, and you're like, oh man, I've got to do that. When are you going next? And then you go with your friend, and now you have yet another experience with somebody that you trust and you really enjoy their company. So it's amazing. So you can talk to them about travel and visit new places. You can tell them about upcoming events and trips. And you can organize and lead trips and programs yourself, right? Why can't you put together a program? Perfectly acceptable to do that. And you role model steps. So to be a good role model is a conscious effort and it requires intelligent processes to ensure the divers are impacted by the diver diamond and the eight E's. You have to think about it, put it into daily practice. So step one, preparation. Know the material you teach and talk about, study in advanced and often about everything diving, be familiar with equipment features and benefits, know policies and procedures for enrolling divers, right? If you don't know how to even enroll a diver in using my SSI, that's not good. So you need to learn how to do that for your, your students. <clears throat> and you need to know what events and trips are upcoming and how to sign them up for those. Step two, Learn about the diver. Ask lots of questions. Learn about them. What are their interests, right? Oh, I like uh, long walks on the beach at night, you know, right? Get to know them. Find out what turns them on and turns them off. And then sell them appropriately. So find out if a product or service matches what they want, what they need and what they're interested in. Ask questions about their likes and dislikes. You know, mayonnaise or mustard? Crunchy peanut butter or smooth? <laughs> These are the questions that my wife and I talked about before we got married. Uh, phrase questions so the diver must explain an answer rather than simply say yes or no. So open-ended. Get them to talk. And then let the diver do most of the talking while you listen because you're an, you're an investigator, you're an intelligence operative, right? You're getting all that information and storing it away so that you can make better decisions on helping them get what's best for them. And be genuine about it. Don't sell it just because it's on sale. Don't sell it just because you like it. Sell it because it's what they need and will benefit them. Because if you buy them or they buy crappy stuff based on your recommendation and then never use it, you did them a disadvantage and you did the store a disadvantage because that customer is not gonna wanna come back, right? Step three, presentation. After you know the diver, what the diver needs and wants, you present the item that fits that particular need and want and say it back to them, right? So feed back to them what it is. Focus only on features and benefits that meet the diver's needs. Don't get distracted off on tangents. And then place the product in the diver's hands, right? If they say, I really actually, yeah, I think that would do very good. You know what, take a look at it, put it on. See how it fits. Try, yeah. Put the straps on, how does that feel? The cushioning in the back, cushioning behind the neck, the rigidity of that particular system or not. Uh, oh, it's really lightweight because it's a travel BCD versus a tech rig, right? Just depends on what they need. Step four, 
Overcome objections. What are objections? I don't really have the money for this. Eh, it's not the color I want. Whatever. Right? That's what an objection is. So if the diver is unsure about purchasing an item, reconfirm the information you gathered. So make sure that you actually understood what they said. Well, I really, really want a blue mask. And you had them a yellow mask. Oh, I thought you said yellow. <laughs> My bad. Here's the blue. Here's the blue. <laughs> All right. So make sure it's correct and complete, that you have the correct picture, and then try it again. Ask more questions to determine the cause of the objection. If someone says, oh, I really can't afford it right now. OK, let's talk about their money. Do you have a budget, or do you just not have money? <laughs> right? These are the things we need, we need to know. I mean, we do it sensitive. We don't do it in, a, in an intrusive way. But it does make a difference. If somebody just isn't spending their money well, but they have the money, you can show them that they can spend it in a different way, in a very respectful way, right? Like, well, I noticed that you have an iPhone X. Are you paying that on payment, or did you save up for that? Oh, I pay payments. Funny enough, we have a layaway program, right? Oh, I bought it outright. Oh, you saved up for it. Yeah, yeah, it took me three months. You know, that's funny. That's $1,000, right? This BCD costs 150 So if you use that logic, if you break it down into three months, we could probably do that in a week and a half, two weeks. See what I'm saying? Just think about it. So provide more information and assurance related to the objection itself, just like I gave as an example. And there's a lot. There are actually programs out there where you can study objections from a sales perspective and learn two or three really good ways back to common objections, which are things like, I don't have the money, there's nowhere to dive near me, things like that, right? And step five, the last step of the sales cycle is to close the sale. Ask for the sale. This is where everybody seems to have a problem. They forget at the end, you really go, now that you've got the BCD in your hand, let's walk up to the cash register. Would you like to pay cash or credit? That's my favorite. How would you like to pay, cash or credit? Right? Everybody says that. Go to a store. If you're in Paris walking down this strip, right, and you go into one of the bigger stores, like, I don't know, I, the ones I don't buy from, you know, the Lancome or something, I don't know, right? And you walk in there, and they're, they're going to be like, okay, how would you like to buy, cash or credit, you know? Well, you, you don't look rich, so maybe you shouldn't be here. <laughs> so don't be put off by asking the diver to buy an item or sign up for a course, program a trip. Just ask them. Do you want to do the course? How would you like to sign up? How do you want to pay? When the product or service is right for the diver and appears to agree, close the sale then. Don't keep talking. Don't keep selling. Don't keep providing more information. Say, oh, you want this mask? Great, let's go ahead and check you out. When you get up there, is there anything else you want? That's cool. That always happens, right? Would you like fries with that? Upsell. You can upsell now. Now we're in a different category. So present additional items to enhance the main one. A, hey, uh, this mask is great. I really love this mask. I think you're going to really enjoy it. I think it was a good choice. Now, we have some anti-fog spray that you can buy for only $75.99. You want a snorkel? You know, would you like a snorkel? Listen, everybody has to have a snorkel. Right? <laughs> now, yeah, okay, we're being facetious and joking around. But you get the, the point behind it. And six, follow up with the diver. So the last point of the sale cycle is closing the sale, but you also want to follow up with them afterwards, right? I talked about that a little bit earlier where I said that if you don't stay in touch, you sell them the wrong stuff, they leave, you don't follow up on that customer service, they're not gonna come back. Now, there's something really important here, that the first sell that you make, right? It's the that's the hardest. And as soon as you've got them on the first sell, now you have a relationship with them, and that sell is a form of trust. So you wanna keep that trust, don't break it. So provide good customer service by supplying additional information. You might even say, hey, listen, let me get your email, put them in the database, and then send them something related to that mask or that BCD. I thought you might want the tech specs on this. There's a PDF that talks about your diving limits on that regulator. Or maybe if you want to learn how to service it, here's the service information on it. You can come back, and we've got a course on how to service that regulator. <laughs> right? Ask the diver to contact you if any issues come up. If there's any problems, contact me. I'll do everything I can to help you out. And ensure that the divers get the most from the purchase and to encourage repeat business. Right? 
All right, almost done. What other duties does an instructor take on? Marketing, branding, inside sales, outside sales, merchandising, community relations, maintenance and repair, record keeping, accounting, correspondence, inventory control, social media. There's more to this than just teaching the class. All right, all right, that's it for this class. We'll take a break and have another lecture later.